We're back at Revelation 1, and I want to finish out today talking about our place as kings and priests unto God. And I read verse 6. It is speaking of Jesus Christ, according to verse 5, and what He's done for us as He's washed us from our sins in His own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and His Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. We pointed out last time by making a comparison with the priests of the Old Testament that in order to be a priest in the Old Testament you had to be born in the chosen family, born in the chosen family, and then you underwent a ritual consecration that qualified you then to go into the house of God and to minister. And we showed that that is analogous in the New Testament to our function as priests. We must be born in the chosen family of God, born again. And that gives us the birth qualification. But then there is a rite of consecration that we undergo when we're baptized, when we put on, on Christ, when we undergo the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the cleansing of the blood of Christ to make our service as priests acceptable. We pointed out that as we are priests, we are also kings, that we reign in life by Christ Jesus. I'm not going to redo all of that other than just to remind you that that's what we talked about last Sunday. And that we function as kings and priests unto God at the same time. And we went into the service of prayer, which is a priestly function, in which we literally uh, have a prevailing influence and have had throughout the centuries through our prayers positing the question, what would this world be and where would the church be if it were not for the prevailing prayers of the saints throughout all the centuries? C.S. Lewis was commenting on prayer and I thought he made, some, made a point that was very, very interesting and very, very sobering to think about. God does not dwell in the dimension of time. He is eternal. Past, present, and future are all the same to him. So that God from all eternity past has always known every prayer that would ever be prayed, including the prayer that we just prayed in this church a few moments ago. He's known that from all eternity. And God hears those prayers that are according to His will. And He pointed out the fact that it is entirely possible, and I believe probable, in fact, I'm just going to say it is, that God has ordered events in past history because of prayers He knew we would pray today Amen. in order to bring about the answer of those prayers. Amen. Now that ought to tell you something about how important this is, the function we occupy as priests and kings unto God. I pointed out to you in conclusion last Sunday that the service we render as kings and priests to God in this holy house should take priority in our thoughts and actions over our pleasures and over our economic concerns. And I remind you again of Matthew chapter 6, Shannon's favorite chapter in his memory. And these words where our Lord said in verses 31 through 33, and I'm going to develop this point further, God willing. Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And I am going to show you that as we function as kings and priests, in fact, I will show you that right now, this is a function in the kingdom of God. Because what king is really a king without a kingdom to function in? And I will give you a verse later that will drive that point home even further. So this thing of seeking first the kingdom of God is meaning that we attach great priority to the function that we render in this house as kings and priests. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now I'm going to set forth a fact, a fact that will be meaningful to you 
and accepted by you only if you are a Bible believer and have a biblical world view. If you do not have a biblical world view, then what I am going to say to you will be just a Christian's fig a figment of a Christian's imagination. Wishful thinking, but not really so. We are as Christians to view anything and everything from a biblical vantage point, including politics. There is nothing about the life we live in this world, nothing, nothing that the Word of God does not address. And it has not a little to say about government and the responsibility of those in government. It tells us specifically what they are there for, what their proper function is so that we as Christians may discern when they are functioning properly and when they are overstepping their bounds. This idea that we should not mix religion and politics is absolutely damnably fallacious. And I better never hear that coming out of anybody's mouth under my ministry. Allegiance, one nation under God, according to the founding fathers. Exactly, exactly. Our Constitution was drafted in the year of our Lord, acknowledging the sovereignty of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is not a little that the Bible has to say about government and its proper function. We should weigh whatever politicians do, decide, or advocate according to the worldview given us in the Word of God. And I could say a lot about that, but I'm going to pass on now to this next point that is very valid if you have a biblical worldview. And that is that the service that we render right here today as kings and priests in the house of God is more vital to the health of our nation than economically profitable policies of government. Amen. You understand that? Far and away more. It weighs far and away more in importance than tax cuts and reducing regulations. As much as I like that and think that's good, but that's not really the most weighty matter in determining the health of our nation. What we render to here, render to God, and I'm going to give you verses to prove this, is more vital to the health of our nation than economically profitable policies of government. I do not agree with everything that President Trump says. I don't agree with everything that any president we've ever had says. You're never going to get a president that's going to agree with everything you think. If you want a president that's going to do everything you think he ought to do, then you need to run for office. And then you can do everything you think ought to be done, and that will settle that. However, there was one thing he said that I thought was true, true, true. He said that the function of religion in this nation is an essential service. He said shutting down churches while keeping open abortion clinics is wrong. And he was as right as right as right can be. It is a gross inconsistency on the part of politicians to implement all kinds of restrictions on society in the name of saving life while keeping abortion clinics open that are destroying life. And you are not going to keep a society safe with all those kinds of restrictions while at the same time tolerating that which brings the judgment of God upon a people and that is the destruction of innocent life. That is a biblical worldview. Period. You can tell I feel passionately about that. But that's the way it is. Now I want to show you, let's go back to the Old Testament. Because remember that the Old Testament had a foreshadowing of good things to come. Our service that we render today was foreshadowed in the Old Testament. The Old Testament church forms a picture for us of what we do today. In fact, our service is described in terms of the service that was rendered under the Old Testament. As I told you last Sunday, the writers of the New Testament dipped their pens into the colors of the Old Testament to paint for us the institution of the New Testament church and its functions such as kings and priests. I want to show you, first of all, this, this harkens back to the Bible studies I was doing over here before the shutdown, in Numbers. And I want to show you how that it was early recognized in Israel 
that the function and the service of the priests and their attendants in the house of God was as vital to the national security of Israel as was their military. The book of Numbers opens with the numbering of the various tribes of all the men that were able to go to war. This was the organization of their military for their national defense. However, there was one tribe that was exempted from that numeration, and that was the tribe of Levi in which we had the family of the priests, because they were warring a warfare also. They were warring a warfare in protecting and maintaining the proper service of the house of God for the security of the nation. And I will show you this in Numbers chapter 1 and verse 53. Numbers 1, 53. But the Levites shall pitch round about the tabernacle of testimony, that there be no wrath upon the congregation of the children of Israel. And the Levites shall keep the charge of the tabernacle of the testimony. No national defense, no military, no matter how well organized, nor how well equipped, would defend that nation if they were the objects of the wrath of Almighty God that first and foremost had to be appeased and was done through. So through the proper function of the office of the Levites and of the priests in the house of God. In fact, it's a very interesting thing that I might point out in passing. If you go to Numbers chapter 23, he's talking about the enumeration of one of the families of the Levites that were not included in the military census. And notice what it says in verse 23. From 30 years old and upward until 50 years old thou shalt number them. All that enter in to perform the service to do the work in the tabernacle of the congregation. Look in the center column reference if you have one. You may see before that uh, infinitive to perform you may see a little number one. And the citation is Numbers 4.23, Numbers 4.23. And you can look at the underlying Hebrew, and it will confirm that this is an alternate rendering. And that is, thou shalt number them that enter in to war the warfare. Because you see, in executing their service in the house of God, they were warring a warfare, and so are we. I am warring a warfare right now. That is why this is written to pastors, that they are to endure hardness as good soldiers of Jesus Christ. I am engaging in warring a warfare even now against lies and deception and against your minds being evilly influenced by a media that does not acknowledge the biblical worldview and the God of the Bible. I'm warring a warfare, and as you hold a biblical worldview and wield whatever influence God gives you, you are doing the same as kings and priests unto God. Then look at Numbers 8, 8, 8, 19. 8, 19. And I have given the Levites as a gift to Aaron and to his sons from among the children of Israel to do the service of the children of Israel in the tabernacle of the congregation and to make an atonement for the children of Israel, that there be no plague among the children of Israel. As we function in this service, this is one of the greatest things we can do to combat any plague that is upon this nation. That there be no plague among the children of Israel when the children of Israel come nigh unto the sanctuary. So you can see from this how it was acknowledged early on in Israel's history that the servants of the priests and their attendants, the Levites, in the house of God was vital to national security, as vital as the military. Then come to 2 Chronicles 29. There was a king in Israel, one of the best in all history. I wish he were here to run for president, I'd vote for him. And that was Hezekiah. Hezekiah. And I want to show you how Hezekiah clearly understood how vital, essential the service of the priesthood was to his nation's well-being. 
When Hezekiah assumed the throne, the church of God had been shut down and the doors were locked and there was no service being performed in the house of God. And, the, and, and they were under military threat. The Assyrian Empire was gaining momentum and was moving ever more toward Judah and Jerusalem. In fact, in the history of Hezekiah's reign, they had already taken possession of several of the cities of Judah and had come nigh to Jerusalem, threatening to overtake it. And when proper service was rendered to God through the priesthood in that day, Almighty God intervened, sent an angel, destroyed in one night 185,000 of the Assyrian army, put them in fear, and they fled for their lives. God intervened and saved Jerusalem, but not at the expense of the priestly service rendered in the house of God. Hezekiah knew the importance of that to his nation's well-being and national security, and therefore the restoration of the proper worship of God was the number one first item in his administration to be addressed, as I will show you presently. 2 Chronicles 29.1, Hezekiah began to reign when he was five and twenty years old. And he reigned nine and twenty years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done. He, in the first year of his reign, I mean, he gets it started off right, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of the Lord. He got the church up and running again and repaired them. And he brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them together into the east street and said unto them, Hear me, ye Levites, sanctify now yourselves and sanctify the house of the Lord your, of God of your fathers and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. For our fathers have trespassed and done that which is evil in the eyes of the Lord our God and have forsaken him, and have turned away their faces from the habitation of the Lord. They've quit going to church. They've got their faces on anything and everything else but church. They've turned their faces away from the habitation of the Lord and turned their backs. And also they have shut up the doors of the porch and put out the lamps and have not burned incense nor offered burnt offerings in the holy place unto the God of Israel. Wherefore, because the church was shut down, the wrath of the Lord was upon Judah and Jerusalem, and he hath delivered them to trouble, to astonishment, and to hissing, as ye see with your eyes. For lo, our fathers have fallen by the sword, and our sons and our daughters and our wives are in captivity for this because the priestly service was not being properly rendered in the house of God, the nation, many in the nation had lost their freedom and were taken into captivity. What I'm driving home to you this morning is what we do here today is very, very vital to the maintenance of our freedom in this country. Very important. Now it is in mine heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel that his fierce wrath may turn away from us. And so he says to the Levites and to the priests, my sons, I love that, my sons, be not now negligent. For the, don't be negligent in this service that you render as priests. I'm saying that to you today. My sons, be not now negligent. This is not a time, these times, these perilous times that we're living in, it's not a time for us to be negligent. It is a time for us to be more diligent in our duty to the house of God than ever we have been if we prize whatever liberties we have left. My sons, be not now negligent, for the Lord hath chosen you to stand before him, to serve him, and that you should minister unto him and burn incense. And by the way, incense in the Bible is a type of prayer. You can see that by looking at Psalm 141. You can see that by looking at Revelation chapter 5 and Revelation chapter 8. Put all that together, and you will see that when I stood in the midst of this congregation, and we bowed our heads together, and you with me addressed God in the way we did, we were burning incense before the living God. Amen. You got that? We have offered our sacrifice of incense in this holy house as his kings and as his priests. Now, 
you can see evidently from this passage that Hezekiah understood this service in the house of God was vital, very vital to national security. Then let's go over to Ezra chapter 6 and we will see that even a pagan king understood this. Even a pagan king, a Persian king, understood how vital this service was. In Ezekiel, pardon me, Ezra chapter 6, I mean to read the passage. Now therefore, now what was happening is the Jews were rebuilding the temple and they had their enemies and they had succeeded in getting it to stop for a while by decree of the king. And then the prophets came along and pled a former decree made by Cyrus. Because you see, the laws of the Medes and Persians didn't change. And Cyrus had authorized the rebuilding of the temple. And so they went back to the prior decree that according to the laws of the Medes and Persians doesn't change and argued that to Darius as why they ought to be able to build that temple with the approval of the government. And he stood by the decree of Cyrus and allowed the work to go on. Anyway, now therefore Tatnai, governor beyond the river. Now therefore Gretchen Whitner, governor beyond the river. Shethar Bosnai and your companions the Afarsakites. But before I say that, before I say any more, let, let, me, let me issue one statement. As much as I do not approve of many of the policies and viewpoints of Gretchen Whitmer, I will give her this, that in her decrees she has made it expressly clear no penalties of violating these orders will be exacted on houses of worship as they engage in worship, for which I thank God. Yeah. I'll give Gretchen Whitmer that. Like I say, I have things about them all I agree with and disagree with, but when I read that, I thank God for what she did. I'll give her that. I'll give her that. Uh, I'm at Ezra 6.6. 6. Thank you. Ezra 6.6. 6. Now therefore, I just said that thing, governor, beyond the river because she's our governor. Now, to, to try to make a present application. That's my whole point. Not to try to just criticize any and everything she does because I just paid her a compliment. Now therefore, Tatnai, governor beyond the river, Shethar Bosnai and your companions, the Afars, the kites, which are beyond the river, be ye far from thence. Let the work of this house of God alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews build this house of God in his place. Moreover, I make a decree. <laughs> Here's an executive order. What ye shall do to the elders of these Jews for the building of this house of God, that of the king's goods, even of the tribute beyond the river, forthwith expenses be given unto these men, that they be not hindered. And that which they have need of, both young bullocks and rams and lambs, for the burnt offerings of the God of heaven, wheat, salt, wine, and oil, according to the appointment of the priests which are at Jerusalem, let it be given them day by day without fail, that they may offer sacrifices of sweet sabbers. You see, this is priestly function. Unto the God of heaven, and pray for the life of the king and his sons. Also I have made a decree that whosoever shall alter this word, let timber be pulled down from his house, and being set up, let him be hanged thereon, and let his house be made a dunghill for this. He was pretty serious about letting the house of God continue in its service. And the God that hath caused his name to dwell there, destroy all kings and people that shall put their hand to altar, and destroy this house of God which is at Jerusalem. <laughs> I love it. I wish he'd run for president. I'd vote for him. Maybe he could be Hezekiah's vice president. <laughs> but he acknowledged how vital and essential this service was for his life and the life of his sons. So I trust I have made the case. Now let's take this a little further to just show you how important this is, not only in the scheme of our own personal lives as Christians, but how this is vital in the scheme of the life of the nation in which we live. I come to Ezra chapter 1, and this is when Cyrus issued the initial decree in which the Jews were permitted to return after 70 years captivity to their land, to their city, to rebuild their temple. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, 
the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. Let me tell you this. The heart of all kings and all presidents and all governors, I don't care what political party they belong to, I don't care what their persuasion is, it's in the hand of God to turn as he will, whenever he will. Don't ever forget that when you pray for them. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing. This was throughout the entire Persian empire, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, The God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house, which is in, an house in Jerus at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. And he goes on and he tells the Jews to go back, rebuild their house, and the Lord their God be with them. So Cyrus acknowledges that God has charged him to build a house, and indeed he did. In fact, this charge was issued in the form of a prophecy made at least 180 years in advance before Cyrus was ever a thought in the mind of his mother and father, before he was ever born. 180 years in advance, God had given this charge to Cyrus. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? Because, <laughs> isn't that really interesting in the light of what I just said? Remind me to come back to it to underscore something. In Isaiah 44, 28, Thus saith Cyrus, He is my shepherd, and shall perform all my pleasure. Notice he even named the man 180 years before this ever happened, long before he was even born. In fact, I computed it one time at least 120 years before his birth, God named him, that saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. So here was this decree of Cyrus given him 180 years in advance through the prophet Isaiah and stirred up his spirit to do just exactly what was prophesied. You can very well bet that at the time this prophecy was made, 180 years in advance of Cyrus's decree, that the Jews were praying for their nation, praying for the welfare of their nation. Men like the prophet Isaiah who was prophesying of the great evils that he saw developing and spreading in his nation, were making prayers and intercession to God for deliverance and salvation. Here, here, praying then, and God is letting us know that he is ordering future events in answer to prayers being prayed at that time, as I have already told you. Amen. Now, now you've got an example of it. Here you had, at the time Isaiah wrote these words, the Assyrian Empire was in ascendancy. After the Assyrian Empire, there would be the Babylonian Empire. And then after the Babylonian Empire, there would be the Persian Empire. And so what we see is God was literally involved in overturning empires and changing governments for the sake of his church, his house, his people, and his priests. Now, look, come over to Ezra chapter 2 and notice how many Jews went back in order to rebuild that temple. We have the number, the computation given us in Ezra chapter 2, 64 and 65. The whole congregation, he's just enumerated the people that went back when Cyrus gave them permission to do so, to rebuild their temple. You have a census given us here in Ezra chapter 2. And then we read in Ezra 2, 64 and 65, the whole congregation together was 40 and 2,303 score. That's 42,360. Beside their servants and their maids, of whom there were 7,337. And there were among them 200 singing men and singing women. 
So when you add the two figures that we are given there in verses 64 and 65, you come up with the fact that you had 49,697 Jews going back to Jerusalem, returning home and reestablishing the house of God and the church of God. 49,697 Jews. That was only a small tiny remnant of the world's population. And yet God ruled in the affairs of all kingdoms and all nations and ordered governments and thrones for the benefit of this tiny remnant of the earth's population so they could serve him in his house. In fact, read Ezra chapter 9, verses 8 and 9, what Ezra had to say about what had happened in this return and rebuilding of the house of God. And Ezra 9 and verse 8. Oh, these are such beautiful words. Ezra 9, 8 and 9. And now, for a little space, grace hath been showed us from the Lord our God. Do you know why we are sitting in this room, in the house of God, executing our function as kings and priests? Because grace has been shown us for a little space. Now I admonish you, let us not receive that grace of God in vain. And now for a little great space, grace hath been showed us from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant. That's just a little bit, a little portion, a little slice of the world's population at that time. To leave us a remnant to escape. Oh, how I pray that that little remnant in Canada can escape can escape. Let me say it again. Escape. To get over that border. To do as these Jews did. That they may escape. And to give us a nail in his holy place. That our God may lighten our eyes. And give us a little reviving in our bondage. Oh may God grant us that. For we were bondmen. Yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage, but hath extended mercy to us in the sight of the kings of Persia to give us a reviving. I am praying constantly, revive thy work, O Lord, in the midst of the years. I join with Ezra the priest in praying for revival to give us a reviving to set up the house of our God and to repair the desolations thereof and to give us a wall in Judah and in Jerusalem. That God would have done what he did in managing and overruling international affairs in the way he did for that small remnant of Jews in order that the priestly service of his house might be restored. Does that not make priestly service in the church important, or does it not? You see what I'm saying, how important this is to our country and to our national security? In fact, I think it can be logically, soundly reasoned that God established these United States and blessed the revolution against the oppression of the British Empire at that time. It can be reasoned that God established these United States as a place of freedom for His churches to offer to Him and priestly service. Amen. In answer to prayers that had been prayed by persecuted saints for centuries in advance. But God, let me finish, God hearing those prayers ordered things in the future in answer. Now your point. I know you want to preach so bad, but I'm sorry. It's my job. <laughs> Just chugging away, you keep at it. But the interesting thing is that at the time this country was founded in 1776, 90% of the people were professing Christians of all sorts and types. 40% were Sovereign Grace Baptists. Yes. And John, Thomas Jefferson himself attended a Baptist meeting in early 1800s and gave them credit for the amendment that allowed I know, I know. That was going to... Just like you're saying. Exactly. Exactly like God, God set up this nation for his churches to exercise, the, exercise their priestly function. I firmly believe that. In fact, 
During those early days of our country's history, Baptist churches were planted thick throughout this land. When I was at the University of Alabama in Birmingham, I was taking the Western Civilization course. And this was a secular university. I remember at that time a lot of these liberal ideas were making their inroads into the colleges and universities. Those were the days of Woodstock. Those were the days of the sexual revolution. And you could see these things making their inroads. But anyway, all that aside, I remember one day, and at this time I was a primitive Baptist a believer in sovereign grace, a sovereign grace primitive Baptist. The word primitive means original or first. They were the original Baptists in this country. And that's why they named themselves that. And I remember the professor saying to the students in the class, he said, this may come as a surprise to you, but the original Baptists in this country were Calvinistic, meaning they believed in sovereign grace. No surprise to me. I knew that as an old primitive Baptist. That's the way it was. And so in answer to the prayers of the saints that had been prayed, God ordered things on the international scene so his churches could have a safe place to worship him and offer the sacrifice of their praise to him. Now, having established, I trust, in your understanding how extremely important this service is that we render, let me now say, the effectiveness of our priesthood, our royal priesthood, is tied to our obedience to God's commandments. Just because we are chosen and born in the chosen family and qualify to be priests by birth, and just because we have been duly consecrated to priests, does not of itself necessarily mean our priesthood will be effective if we fall into sin, backsliding, and disobedience, and negligence. It is incumbent upon us as royal priests to walk worthy of this calling. As it is said in Ephesians 4, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. And I'm going to go and show you from the Old Testament that the effectiveness of the office of king and the effectiveness of office of priest was tied to their obedience to the law of God. And it's the same way today. Come to Exodus chapter 19. I told you I would give you a verse to show that as we function here, we function in a kingdom. We function as a kingdom. And that is why we are told to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. In Exodus 19, 5 through 6. Now therefore God says to the Jews at Mount Sinai, If ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, Kingdom suggests king. A kingdom of priests is a group of priest kings, king priests, or a royal priesthood. Do you not see that? A kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. This same principle applies in the New Testament to our royal priesthood service in 1 John chapter 3. Remember, one of the most vital services we render as kings and priests is the offering of our prayers and intercessions to God. That is our holy incense that we burn as kings and priests. In 1 John chapter 3, 22 and 23, And whatsoever we ask, this is referring directly to our prayer life, our burning incense as kings and priests, and whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Notice the keeping of the commandments tied in with the effectiveness of our prayer life. Remember, it is the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man, not an unrighteous one, that avails much. When churches cave into unrighteousness, do not practice proper church discipline, tolerate things in their midst they should not, they are rendering their priestly service ineffective. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another as he gave us commandment. Now let me give you a couple of examples. Remember, we see this all pictured out for us in the Old Testament. Now let me give you the biblical examples that underscore what I'm talking about. 
We're first of all going to consider the office of the king in the Old Testament and how the effectiveness of that office was tied to his obedience to God. Come over to 1 Kings chapter 2. 1 Kings chapter 2. 1 Kings 2. And like I say, this will weigh in very heavily with you if you have a biblical viewpoint. If you don't, then you think I'm just indulging imagination. But I'm not. And the judgment day will reveal it. 1 Kings 2, 1. Now the days of David drew nigh that he should die. And there is a time when it's right to die. There's t there's t My mother reached a point in her life she should die. Dying was the right thing for her to do. And he charged Solomon his son saying, I go the way of all the earth. And we're going to come to that point too when it, we should die. It's just the way it is. Be strong therefore and show thyself a man. And this is what manhood is all about. It isn't about muscles. It isn't about excelling in sports. This is what manhood is really all about. And keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways. Takes a man to do this, to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies as it is written in the law of Moses, that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest and whithersoever thou turnest thyself. Watch it, here's the point. That, you keep those commandments, that the Lord may continue his word which he spake concerning me, saying, if thy children take heed to their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, there shall not fail thee, said he, a man on the throne of Israel. Notice the effectiveness and perpetuation of this office of kingship was tied to the obedience of those who held that office. And this is why we find an overturn of kings happening often in the history of Israel because of the disobedience of their kings until finally, finally, there was no one to sit on that throne for centuries until Jesus came. Now, that's for the king. Let's get the priest. Come over to 1 Samuel chapter 2. Just because you were born in the priestly family and just because you were consecrated did not of itself mean that your priesthood would be effective. In fact, you could lose your priesthood, your right to serve in the house of God through disobedience. I don't think I'm going to read the entire passage, but I'm going to read enough of it to give you the thought. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, 27, 2, 27. And there came a man of God unto Eli. Now Eli's sons were priests and they were horrible. They were fornicating with the women. They were taking the fat of the sacrifices that belonged to God and they were keeping it for themselves. They were in it to enrich and engorge themselves. And there came a man of God unto Eli and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Did I plainly appear into the house of thy father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? And did I choose him out of all of the tribes of Israel to be my priest? You see, Eli was part of the chosen family that qualified by birth to be priests, by election and birth. I love that. Election and birth. Election, that's how we qualify. Election and birth, called the new birth. And I did choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest and to offer upon mine altar to burn incense. That's what we were doing this morning, people. And to wear an ephod before me. And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation? And honorest thy sons above me to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel my people. Wherefore the Lord God of Israel saith, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord saith, Be it far from me, for them that honor me I will honor, and them that uh, despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days come that I will cut off thine arm and the arm of thy father's house, that there shall not be an old man in thine house. And you go on and read, and you will find out that the priesthood was taken from the family of Eli, because of their disobedience. Look at Hosea 4, 6. 
Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6. This is a shocking verse. I think one of the most uh, moving experiences I ever had was when I was preaching on this in Minnesota and I had baptized some people in Nebraska and I had baptized them into the church at Minnesota because that was the most geographically close place to them and they came to pay their first visit to their brethren in Minnesota and I preached on this and there was a woman that I baptized in Nebraska she's the only one left of the three I baptized and she is to this day still a very faithful member of the church she lives in Excelsior Springs and she's a member of the church under the pastorate of Chad Wagner but I remember when I was preaching on this passage and I pointed out something it was saying and she went oh. Oh. you could hear her this hit her so profoundly and I hope it will hit you as profoundly verse 6 my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge now why don't they know I'll tell you why because they don't want to know there are none so ignorant as those who do not want to know Amen. because thou hast rejected knowledge I will also reject thee that thou shalt be no priest to me seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God how many Baptist churches in this country have forgotten what the Bible even is don't even know what it is don't even know where it is that thou shalt be no priest to me seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God and this is what took that sister's breath while God is forgetting I will also forget thy children the future of our children is at stake on our being priests and kings to God functioning properly let us so order our conversation as priests that God doesn't forget our children Malachi 2 an indictment against a corrupted priesthood pitifully corrupted from what it was designed by God to be so corrupted I'll just it, it uses very strong language to show God's displeasure at their professed continuation of priestly service and now O ye priests this commandment is for you and it's for you too folks if ye will not hear if ye will not lay it to heart to give glory unto my name saith the Lord of hosts I will even send a curse upon you and I will curse your blessings oh my God if there's ever been a blessed nation it's the one we live in but trust me God can send a curse on those blessings yea I've cursed them already because you do not lay it to heart behold I will corrupt your seed and here's what he thinks of their priestly service now and spread dung upon your faces what do you mean Lord even the dung of your solemn feasts I consider your service to me now a pile of dung and, not, and, sh and one shall take you away with it and ye shall know that I've sent this commandment unto you that my covenant might be with Levi saith the Lord of hosts my covenant was with him of life and peace and I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me and was afraid before my name the law of truth was in his mouth and iniquity was found in his lips he walked with me in peace and equity and did turn many away from iniquity for the priest lips should keep knowledge and they should seek the law at his mouth for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts but you've departed out of the way you've caused many to stumble at the law you've corrupted the covenant of Levi saith the Lord of hosts therefore have I also made you contemptible and base before all people according as ye have not kept my ways but have been partial in my law 
Why is it? Our brother Justin talked about this the other day in his message. Why is it that religion and preachers have now become a contemptible joke in the eyes of our culture? Might it be because the priesthood has been corrupted? And this is the judgment suffered for it. Do I make a case, brethren, for how important this is? The continuation effectiveness of our royal priesthood is indeed tied to our obedience to God. So I urge all of you to examine your ways and make sure that this one thing, that above everything else that you do and purpose in your life, that you purpose to serve the Lord God Almighty and keep His commandments. I meant to bring it today. I'm at that age where if a thought comes into my mind, if I don't act on it right then, it's apt not to happen. Have I got a witness? Wait ten more years, Brother Dan. Yes, thank you for that encouragement. My Aunt Nell would put it this way, let me say it before it cools on my mind, knowing that if she didn't say it right then, it would be forgotten and not said. Years ago, I bought a book when I was a Methodist. It was called The Mighty Savior. It was written by a man named Moore. He was for a while the bishop of the Conference of Methodists in Florida. My pastor knew him personally. And it wasn't really a deep book, but I was a babe back then, so I probably found it good. But there was one thing in it I remember, and I wish I had brought it so I could have read the story. But I'm just going to have to try to grab it out of what I remember of it. But I think I know it well enough to know. They had taken one of the royal family, probably one of the heirs to the French throne, captive during the French Revolution. And there was this effort that was being made to try to corrupt the king, to do all kinds of contemptible, uh, horrible things, basically to corrupt him as a future king and a part of the royal family. And the story goes, whether it's true or not, it's still a good story, that they would keep making these efforts to corrupt him, and he would keep resisting it and saying, I cannot do that. I cannot do that. I am the son of a king. Do you get the point? When Satan comes and he th brings these juicy temptations in front of you, you need to look at it and say, I cannot, I cannot. I am a king. I am a priest to God. And I must walk worthy of my calling and of my office. It is interesting when you pay attention to the Bible and adopt its worldview. You will notice in the history of Israel how God permitted or restrained the wrath of the heathen nations in relation to Israel's obedience or disobedience to Him. When they obeyed, the heathen nations were restrained. When they disobeyed, they were allowed to oppress. Read the book of Judges. You'll see that dynamic going on throughout. So you see, our condition before God as His church has a tremendous bearing on what happens in the governments of this earth. This is why in the book of Revelation, He begins the book by addressing the conditions of the churches. And He shows things that will develop on the scene of history as we move toward the end times and the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But He starts with the condition of the churches. He does not hold the churches responsible to change the world. He holds the churches responsible to change whatever they can among them that needs to be changed with the understanding that when the church functions as it ought, God intervenes in dealing with the nations for the sake of His people in them and among them. And that is why Peter says in 1 Peter 4 and verse 17, For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And that's the way the book of Revelation is designed, to begin at the house of God. Now, brethren, as kings and priests, I say to you that it is very important that we see ourselves for what the Scripture declares us to be, kings and priests, and not what our deceptive feelings and emotions tell us. Let me say it again. 
We need to see ourselves, view ourselves, for what the truth of Scripture declares us to be, which are kings and priests, rather than what our deceptive feelings tell us. I ask you this morning, do you perceive yourself as an outcast from God or as a priest with access to Him? Which way do you perceive yourself? As an outcast from God or a priest with access to Him? Do you perceive yourself as a victim of life and circumstances or as a reigning, conquering king unto God? May I say it again. Do you see yourself as a victim of life and circumstances or as a reigning and conquering king to God? Now this position we occupy as kings and priests, well, it is one we will occupy forever and ever. So that as we function in the house of God as kings and priests today, we are getting a foretaste of what will be our everlasting portion. This is a foretaste of things to come. That is why one of the hymns that we sing that talks about our assembly says, "'Tis like a little heaven below." And it is. And it is. In fact, Jacob, when he was at Bethel and said, this is none other than the house of God, what else did he say? And the gate of heaven. Today, in this assembly, you stand at the very portals of heaven itself. This will be your portion forever. In Revelation 5, 9 through 10, and when the four beasts had taken the book, I'm reading verses 9 through 10, I'll get verse 8. The four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals. For thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us unto our God. Notice the effect of redemption, the washing of the blood, as we pointed out last time. And has made us unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. How long shall we reign? Revelation 22, 5. Revelation 22, 5. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Revelation 7, 14 through 15. That takes care of the kings forever and ever. Let's get the priests forever and ever. And notice again, the priesthood being the effect of the washing of the blood of the Lamb. Revelation chapter or 7, 14, and 15. I meant to put this in the outline. I only noticed that I had failed to do so this morning. And I said unto them, Sir, thou knowest. These, he sees these people arrayed in white robes, and he's asking, Where do they come from? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now notice the effect of the cleansing blood. They are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. Who was authorized by the law of God and who only was authorized by the law of God to serve in the temple? Who was it? The priests. This is priesthood. And serve Him day and night in His temple and He that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. As they say in the common jargon, it don't get no better than that. Now let your mind breathe for a moment. Let it breathe for a moment. Take in a deep breath. Breathe in that stale air. Now, in, I just want to go a step further and just show you a very, very vital part of your priestly service as it's declared here in this passage. I don't think I'm going to get as far as I 
thought I would get, but we'll get this far. I want to get to the close of the verse. Having told us that we're kings and priests unto God, made so by Jesus Christ, now he says this with respect to Jesus Christ. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The word glory means praise. I'm, I'm going to show you a part of your incense, a vital part. I'm going to show you a vital part of worshiping God. Do you ever ask yourself, how do we actually really worship God? I'm going to show you a vital part of that. To Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Glory means praise, honor, and thanksgiving offered in adoration. So whenever you're counting your many blessings and thanking God, you are giving Him glory, just as we did this morning. I try to incorporate that in my prayers. To give thanks to God, we are taught that is a vital, vital part. To make everything known to God with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Make sure that ingredient is always mingled in. Now dominion, to Him be glory and dominion. Those of you that love sovereign grace will love the definition of dominion. Dominion means the power or right of governing and controlling. Sovereign, supreme authority. Lordship, sovereignty, rule, sway, control, influence. To Him be dominion. To Him be sovereignty forever and ever. Now, it is a fact, whether you acknowledge it or not, that Jesus Christ has sovereignty and will wield sovereignty forever and ever. Three passages will make that plain. Whether you acknowledge it or not is going to do it. Three passages. Isaiah chapter 9. Bear with me now. This ties right in with the sacrifice. This is part of burning the incense, people. We want to keep the incense burning on the altar. There's three things. We want to make sure as priests of God we do that the priests of God were made responsible to do in the temple of old. We want to keep the candle burning. Keep your lights burning. Shine as lights in the world. Jesus taught us to let our lights be always burning in Luke chapter 12. We want to keep the candlestick burning. Second, we want to keep the cakes of showbread on the table before the Lord. Those cakes of showbread represent you, just as they represented the 12 tribes of Israel. Today, you, the cakes of showbread, are on the table before the Lord. Keep it like that. You hear me? Keep it like that. And the third thing, to keep the incense burning. Keep the prayers and the worship and the thanksgiving going up. You hear me? You hear me? Every week, they put a fresh lay of sweat, 12 loaves of hot bread on that altar to be there all week long. Today, we lay the fresh bread on the table and see that it's laid there next week. Okay? And keep the lamps burning. Keep them trimmed. Keep the filth out of your light so, life so the light can shine. I hadn't planned on saying this, but it's so apropos, doesn't it fit? And keep the incense burning. <laughs> it's our service, children. Wow. Isaiah 9. But anyway, he is going to reign whether you acknowledge it or not. Verses 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom. See, that government's going to increase. It's not going to end. It's going to go on forever and ever. To him be dominion forever and ever. Upon the throne of David and upon the kingdom to order it and to establish it with justice, judgment and justice from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts shall perform this. Come over to Luke chapter 1. I'm just showing you he is reigning forever and ever. Luke 1, 31 through 33. Gabriel says to Mary, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. 
He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. To him be dominion forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. And last verse, Revelation 11, 15. Revelation 11, 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. You know what those verses are telling you, children? Jesus is in control. He will always be in control. He is and will reign forever and ever. The book of Revelation is the story of that everlasting dominion. Now, it becomes us as kings and priests to recognize and admit that fact. It will do all of us a great deal of good to acknowledge and admit and confess the truth that Jesus has dominion forever and ever. Because you see, that is one of the things we do in worship. And that is that we ascribe to God what is properly His. That's one of the ways you worship God. God is great. You worship God when you tell Him He is. God is sovereign. You worship Him when you tell Him He is. You see the point? That's what you do. You ascribe to God the honor that is his, whether you ascribe it or not. But it's to your benefit greatly to acknowledge it. Now let me show you three verses that demonstrate what I just said as being involved in worship, and then we'll be done. Deuteronomy 32.3. Deuteronomy 32.3. I won't even get to breaking down the amen. Oh yes, there's a sermon in that too. I did that one time. You may remember the Ephesians series. I spent a great deal of time on the last word in the whole book. Amen. Or amen, depending on whether you are pronouncing it according to the pronunciation guide in the Bible or whether you're... And I'm not saying the other's an incorrect pronunciation. I've got to check it out in a dictionary. Probably both of them are okay. Amen. Amen. Say it whichever way you like it, as long as you say it. Deuteronomy 32.3. I will publish the name of God, of the Lord. Ascribe ye greatness unto God. See, God is great, period. That's just what he is. He's an infinite, eternal being. He was great before you ever existed. He'll be a great forever. But you're taught in worship to tell him he's great. Ascribe that to him. Acknowledge what he is. That's worship. Psalm 68 and verse 34. Psalm 68 and verse 34. This is part of the burning of the incense before the throne. Psalm 68 and verse 34. Ascribe ye strength unto God. Now God is strong by his very nature. He can't be anything but strong. He is strength and power itself. But we're supposed to tell him that. We're supposed to recognize that and ascribe that to him. That's worship. That's worship. Ascribe ye strength unto God. His excellency is over Israel, and his strength is in the clouds. And lastly, Psalm 96, verses 7 through 6. So when, for example, I'll give you examples. Uh, we sing a song, How Great Thou Art. You know what we're doing? We're ascribing greatness to God. We're worshiping him. When we say, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. We are acknowledging all blessings flow from Him. We are ascribing to Him the source of all blessedness. That's worship, don't you see? That's worship. Just tell Him how wonderful He is, how great He is, how good He is, how wise He is. That's worship. And lastly, Psalm 96, 7 through 9. Give unto the Lord, O ye kindreds of the people, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Now, do you actually think that God has strength because we give it to him as a gift? Obviously not. God has strength. He is strong just by his very being. You give strength to the Lord by acknowledging, by ascribing strength to him. You see what I'm saying? Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering 
and come into his courts, just like you've done today, presenting your body a living sacrifice in the courts of his house. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. And so glory and dominion belong to Jesus Christ by right. And as his priests, it is our duty in worship to ascribe to him the greatness, the glory, and the dominion that is properly and rightly his because of who he is. This is our incense. This is how we function as priests. And we have a tremendous influence on the course of nations, on the course of this world, and on the future of this country when we come here and we tell God how great He is in worship. And well might that statement be completed, co concluded with, Amen, so be it. <laughs>